Hello, everyone, and welcome to CFRI's April 2016 CF Discovery Series. I'm Siri Vaith Dunn, and I am the Programs and Outreach Manager here at CFRI. And at this moment, we are live streaming here from our home studio at CFRI's offices in Palo Alto, California. And I'm very pleased to welcome our guests who are here in the room. And I'm also very pleased to welcome our guests who are attending online. We have a very special program for you tonight, but before we get started, I want to thank Vertex Pharmaceuticals, Genentech, Chiesi USA for generously sponsoring tonight's event, and I also want to give a special thanks to Gilead Sciences for providing additional support for this evening's program. As always, we urge you to work together with your doctor, with your healthcare team, and please note that no information provided tonight is intended for a patient's diagnosis or treatment. Tonight's program is being produced by your CFRI live team, Scott Wakefield, David Suhu, and Mary Convento. This is happening in real time, and at the end of the presentation, I urge everybody to ask questions because we have an extremely knowledgeable speaker, and this is a great opportunity to hear directly from a top expert in the field of CF lung transplants. And for you online viewers, you can click in the chat box on your screen and Mary Convento will be tracking your questions, and at the end of the presentation, she will ask them on your behalf. So let's get started. While we celebrate the many recent advances in CF therapies and medications, the tragic reality is that for many CF patients with advanced lung disease, lung transplantation remains the only hope for prolonging one's life. But for a wide range of reasons, lung transplantation is fraught with its own risks and challenges. We are very fortunate to have with us tonight Dr. Jasleen Kukreja, Program and Surgical Director of the Lung Transplantation Program at the University of California in San Francisco. Dr. Kukreja is a renowned surgeon, and UCSF is ranked highest in the nation for patient survival rates post-transplant. I have to confess that until <laughs> Dr. Kugreja walked in the door. I was holding my breath because she is extremely busy. In fact, while we were confirming details um, for tonight's presentation, it was a Monday, and she told me she had done three transplants over the weekend. That is incredible. So UCF, UCSF has integrated new and innovative strategies for lung transplantation, and this is a wonderful opportunity to hear about them firsthand. So please help me welcome Dr. Jasleen Kudreja. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Siri and CFRI, for having me here today. Um, I'm going to give you a surgeon's perspective on uh, different options available for cystic fibrosis patients. But I have brought with me my esteemed colleague from the medical side, Dr. Kleinhans, who is in the audience here in the room with us. In the event, there are medical questions that come up, because I am, after all, a cutter. Um, so when I look back, I was a teenager at the time when my uh, mom uh, died from heart disease. She was very young at that time. I think uh, today, if she had a chance, uh, that second chance, she would have been alive. Not everyone gets that second chance at life, and I'm hoping that I'm able to give this opportunity to the cystic fibrosis patients. Um, I am going to be talking about um, a uh, industry-sponsored trial very briefly uh, towards the end of my uh, talk, but I have no financial relationships uh, with them. I'm also going to be presenting a lot of photographs. Hopefully none of them are too graphic for our viewers, so please use viewer discretion. Uh, and I have obtained uh, permission to present this uh, uh, from the patients, uh, to present this for educational purposes. So to briefly uh, give you an overview of my talk, first we're going to talk about um, how we can uh, bridge an acutely ill cystic fibrosis patient. Uh, and by that, I'm referring to ECMO. I think a lot of people in the audience probably already are familiar with what ECMO means. And the second part of the talk is going to focus on breathing lung transplant technology. And uh, some people know it as uh, lung in the box. So let me introduce you to Jane. She is a, 
an aspiring young teacher, dynamic, full of hope and dreams. She's 22 years old and has cystic fibrosis. She's been doing quite well at home with all the treatments, etc. But despite all, doing all the right things, she develops a CF exacerbation. And for that, she gets admitted to the hospital. And despite all their interventions at the outside hospital, she requires uh, intubation and uh, to be put on the uh, ventilator, as shown in the picture on the, on the uh, uh, right side. Despite being on the ventilator, her oxygen levels remain very low and her carbon dioxide levels are very high. And as, as a result of the high carbon dioxide level, she's in a coma. So she's transferred to us in this condition for further management and treatment. We know that in her current condition, Jane has very high risk of not making it. This basically is uh, showing a graph showing uh, how the cystic fibrosis patients, when they get mechanically ventilated, intubated, that their risk of uh, uh, dying is very high. On the x-axis, the horizontal axis is the uh, age of the patients, and on the y-axis, the vertical axis, is the number of patients. The gray bars represent patients who died, and the top clear bars represent people who actually survived the mechanical intubation. So as you can see, people over the age of 15 who needed mechanical ventilation, actually major overwhelming majority of them did not make it. So under these conditions, acute respiratory failure requiring a mechanical ventilation, majority of the transplant centers will not accept her due to this high mortality. Uh, risk. So, in 2016, we still have no cure for CF. These drugs have had some modest effect. Gene therapy remains a pipe dream. Overwhelming majority of these patients are going to die from their lung infections. So, what can I do for her right now for Jane in her current condition as a surgeon? Her only option, hope to survive at this point, is a new set of lungs. So far, I've only given you bad news, but here's the good news. As much as you want to delay getting transplantation, the good news is that, that when you do come to that stage where you need transplantation, that CF patients compared to all other disease entities, the green line here represents CF patients, and all the other entities are pulmonary fibrosis, pulmonary hypertension, et cetera, et cetera, emphysema. Of all these other conditions why people get transplanted, CF patients have the best long-term survival. The news gets even better. Over the last couple of decades, as the surgical technique has evolved and uh, intensive care uh, interventions and anti-rejection medications have gotten better and the long-term follow-up of these patients has gotten better, the CF outcomes has even gotten uh, much better in this last decade. So this is all good, but what about Jane? Can Jane in her current state make it to transplant? Because as I showed you previously, that her risk at this stage of being intubated, mechanically ventilated, her risk of dying is very high. The longer she stays on the ventilator in that stupor state, the weaker she gets. And we know that debility is a strong predictor of bad outcome following lung transplant. So how do we break her out of this cycle? Mechanical ventilation is just a band-aid for her. Sooner or later, it will fail. So my job is to keep her alive, and not only keep her alive, but also keep her active and engaged and exercising so I can get her to a life-saving procedure, which is transplant, and not have her get debilitated. So at this point, what she needs is a artificial means to, to keep her going, and um, whether it's lungs or whether it's heart or lungs. And those artificial organs 
we are able to provide this technology to the patients and this is called ECMO. What ECMO stands for is extracorporeal membrane oxygenation support. So let's just call it ECMO, not go into the details. And this is uh, one of the ways you can uh, start somebody on ECMO. You can either access through the neck or through the groin and sometimes through the chest. So. Um, in the next few slides, I'm going to briefly review what ECMO is, give you a little bit of history about it, and, and our experience at UCSF. So in terms of history, the very first ECMO for lung failure was performed about 50 years ago, not too far from here, uh, by one of my teachers, Dr. Don Hill in San Francisco. This is what the gadget looked like. It practically took up the entire room. So this is the device, and this is obviously the patient connected to different IVs. Like anything else, evolution is inevitable. This is where we started 50 years ago. Then about 10 years ago, we evolved to this. Last five years, we have this. And the newest toy on the market is this, which is just hot off the press last week. A device that now we can hold in our hands and patients can wear the device on their person. Types of ECMO, uh, there are different types of ECMO that can support both the lungs or heart lungs. And the decision uh, in terms of how we decide what, what kind of support a patient needs. I'm not going to go into that uh, in the interest of time, but suffice it to say that it is a, uh, this is where surgeons' expertise and the treatment team's expertise comes in very, is very critical to decide what kind of support they need. Um, Timing of ECMO, as far as like in terms of when to initiate our ECMO, is even more dependent on the treating team's uh, expertise. Um, having said that, as the experience around the country at different centers is growing, people are starting to initiate uh, institute ECMO early and early in the course of their patient's acute illness to prevent the debility and the uh, the death that we uh, talked about so far. Goals, as I keep saying, and this is very key to a successful lung transplant outcome, the goals are not only to keep the patient alive, but have a um, walking, talking, exercising patient to have the best outcome. Um, sorry. So I'm going to, in the next few slides, just to show you what it means to have a patient on this artificial heart-lung uh, machine or heart lung organs, artificial ones, and how we can get the patients to do what we are hoping they're able to do. So this patient, this is a 51-year-old um, patient with cystic fibrosis who was emergently transferred to us from an outside hospital, kind of like Jane. She was um, on mechanical ventilation. So a couple of days after her arrival, we um, uh, put her on this uh, ECMO device, uh, and this one is through her neck, as you can see. Uh, we extubated her and put a temporary tracheostomy. By the way, tracheostomy is a very routine procedure for us. It's b both for patient's comfort and for prevention of uh, long-term complications. It is a temporary thing. It can always be taken out once they have recovered. So patient was extub she was extubated and we ended up putting a tracheostomy in for those reasons. And as you can see, she's only being supported on this artificial lung machine and she's not no longer on the ventilator. This is just a mask. And this is she on the right hand side we're able to exercise her on the treadmill, okay? So this is what we want. This is the kind of patient we all want to transplant. The next case is that of a central ECMO cannulation. Remember the picture that I showed you in the beginning, a cartoon figure that you could put it in the neck, you could put it in the groin, or you can put it in the chest. In this particular patient, this patient was also transferred to us from an outside hospital, intubated, medically paralyzed and sedated because she could not be uh, oxygenated otherwise. And in her case, because she needed the heart support as well, we chose to cannulate her in the chest. 
that's why you don't see any tubing outside because it's under her gown in the chest. And this patient, two days after arrival, by the way, she did not need a tracheostomy. She actually didn't need even uh, uh, oxygen at this point, although we have her on on the oxygen with just a nasal cannula. So we also, two days later, after doing the procedure, we were able to get her up walking, not on any kind of mechanical ventilation support. So, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> so much for that. Um, this is a next patient, similar patient. Uh, this, this patient is uh, in her 20s. She's with cystic fibrosis. She was actually on our waiting list, waiting for lungs to become available. She was at home when she developed a pneumothorax. I hope everybody knows what that means. Essentially, leaky lungs for whatever reason. And uh, regardless of the uh, conservative management or surgical intervention, this pneumothorax did not resolve. And as a result of that, her left lung, which was already uh, not functioning was completely down. Now zero function was being contributed from the left lung. So as a result of that, she had oxygenation problems and even more so ventilation problem. As a result of this uh, bronchopleural fistula, her carbon dioxide levels also went very high and she needed to be mechanically ventilated at that point. She was intubated, uh, but five or six days after um, Stabilization, we took her to the operating room and we put a cannula in her neck. You can barely see the cannula in the neck and this is the tubing coming out. We also trached her like we did most of our patients and she's also no longer on the breathing machine and she uh, is uh, exercising on the treadmill. This is an example of a couple of other patients. These are not, these are actually second time coming for transplant. They developed chronic rejection and uh, they had the cannulas put in their neck. Both of them, same, same device, uh, same uh, endpoint. They're up and about. This gentleman is uh, getting some support, but not much. Uh, the gentleman on the, the left was actually one of the first cases done in the country of uh, walking ECMO, and he, he's, on, he, he's a celebrity now. His uh, uh, case is presented at every conference. And the gentleman on the right uh, had uh, cystic fibrosis, but he developed chronic rejection, and for that we retransplanted him, and we used ECMO to, to bridge him to transplant, to keep him alive to transplant. Now what about Jane? Um, Coming back to Jane, this is how Jane presented to us in coma on breathing machine. A couple of days after, we traked her. We put this cannula in. She was walking in the uh, ICU. She emergently presented to us. So we did an emergent, super urgent evaluation for transplant because she'd never been referred for it before. Uh, so she was new to us. Uh, this is the day when the organs became available after 15 days of ECMO support. And this is her picture as she is in the operating room getting ready for transplant. And uh, during this time when she woke up, she decided that she wanted to cut her hair. So she cut her hair in the hospital. And this is she on the day of discharge from the hospital after transplant two weeks later. So what about our experience? We've been doing ECMO for last 10 to 12 years, so we've gained a lot of experience at UCSF. Um, I'm not going to go way back. I'm just going to go the last 12, 13 years. Between 2003 to 2016, actually as of this month, we have done about 509 lung transplants. Of those 509 lung transplants, 37 patients needed to be put on ECMO prior to transplant because they otherwise would not have made it. They would have died. There were no other options left for them. And of those 37, we successfully transplanted 32 of them. 21 were males, 11 were females. And as you can see, the uh, oldest person who got um, uh, bridged to transplant was 64 years old in both categories. 
and this one being just this uh, uh, last uh, five days, five days ago. Uh, and we, the youngest patient we bridged was a 15-year-old uh, girl. Median age for our cohort of this 37 patient, this, and age range, this, as I showed. Not, now, what about the remaining five patients? In the remaining five patients, they, we could not successfully bridge them to transplant. There were several reasons for it. One, that um, family chose not to continue the, the care on ECMO because it is no walk in the park. As much as I show patients walking on the treadmill, et cetera, et cetera, it is hard work for both the team and, more importantly, for the patient and for the families to watch their loved ones go through it. So in five of those cases, uh, uh, we had one reason or another why we could not successfully bridge them to transplant. In others, the disease progressed to the point that they ultimately developed a multi-system organ failure on ECMO. And in others, regardless of the, our best um, hope and uh, desire to get them walking, we could not get them up out of bed. They were debilitated, so we could not um, successfully bridge them to transplant, and support was withdrawn in those cases. I'm gonna spend some time on this slide. So the, the case series that I just showed you, the 37 patients and 32 who made it, we published this data uh, in uh, 2012. So looking at this graph on the uh, horizontal x-axis, this is the number of years after transplant, and on the y vertical axis is survival. The top two lines represent outcomes from our program, okay? And the bottom two lines here represent, uh, curves represent uh, the um, outcomes in the nation, overall average. So when you look at it, the blue line, blue line represent patients who were transplanted at UCSF who came from home on nasal cannula oxygen. They were not supported in any other shape or form. The green line, and you can see the survival is almost 100% in those patients, okay? The green line represent UCSF patients who needed to be put on ECMO, the 32 that I showed you, prior to transplant. While their outcome is not as good as the one who were not on any kind of support, but interestingly, when you look at the outcomes of the patients who were supported on ECMO and compare it to the national average of non-supported patients, our patients have still done better than the non-supported patients in the country, okay? And certainly way better than the nationally, uh, national data of uh, patients who were on ECMO. So there's a quite a bit uh, difference in the uh, survival. So ours is the uh, largest published series to date, in, at least in this country, and I am just gonna go briefly over the global experience, including the countries um, in Europe. So we're at the bottom here. As you can see, our outcomes are excellent, and we are the largest ser published series to date. Other series are uh, 10 or 24, and the next largest series is outside of the U.S. from Austria, 34 patients that were bridged to transplant on ECMO, but their survival was not as great. Even three years out, our patients have a survival of 83%. And as I showed you on the graph, what is interesting is that when we compare our ECMO bridged patients to non-ECMO patients in the UNOS database, we are doing better at each time point. Any questions from anyone right now before I uh, move on to the uh, next topic? I, I was interested in that Columbia result. Yes, let me go back to it. Yes. 100%. So they were very uh, selective when they started the program in terms of who they were going to put on the device. So they selected the best possible candidates. Whereas in our series, as you can see, we've taken 64 years old with multiple comorbidities, et cetera, et cetera. And number two, their numbers are too small. So.
and uh, we have now added uh, way more patients to this list if you look at the combined list. Any other questions? What, what's the longest uh, you had a patient on the ECMO device before you were able to and still do surgery? Is there Very any good length question. of time? Um, as much as, I, as I'm saying, I'm going to repeat myself, it is no walk in the park. Um, uh, the longest we've had was a young lady, 18 years of age. She was on the device for 39 days. In the uh, published series that we presented, there was someone at Kentucky who was on the device for 72 days. Yes. And I believe uh, this past year, um, Cleveland uh, did a case um, of a um, young uh, physician uh, who was on the device for about three and a half months. I'm curious, is this used nationwide? Or are there just a few transplant centers that use this? Very good question. So we were one of the... Um, the first ones, uh, although there are, um, uh, Duke was also very involved with this uh, technique or technology, and and in the last couple of um, years, as the uh, experience is growing, now more and more centers have come on board, but it still is uh, um, relatively new intervention for majority of the centers. Uh, I would say. The centers that have the most experience on the West Coast is us. Uh, in the uh, Midwest would be uh, probably Cleveland Clinic and the um, uh, in Michigan area. Chicago is starting to do it. I know in speaking to a couple of surgeons there. And obviously Duke has a lot of experience. And on the East Coast, I would say um, um, Pittsburgh has a lot of experience. Um, Temple is starting to build their program. So, so it's still not as widespread, but it is gaining popularity. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about the common um, exclusion factors, like what would disqualify a patient from this bridge? Very good question. Um, so it is uh, not for everyone. And some of the things we consider when we are thinking about um, uh, ECMO is age. Uh, but as you saw, age is a moving target, and uh, younger age means, you know, one thing to one person and another thing to another person. And it's not so much the chronological age, but more how a patient eyeballs. You know, if somebody is really, you know, malnourished and, you know, debilitated, it's probably not a good, good tech, uh, technology to utilize in them. Um, patients who have... Um, um, Single system failure means it's only their lungs that are failing. Every other system is intact. That, that would be the person you want to put the device in to keep those organ, other organs uh, going. If the patient does develop multi-system organ failure, then it's probably not a good idea to continue to support them because it would be very challenging to, to treat and manage them after transplant if they even make it to transplant. Uh, this technology does require uh, to be on uh, blood thinning medication. So if somebody has bleeding disorders, uh, it's probably not a good idea to, to start this uh, uh, intervention on them. Um, um, Mary Ellen, can you think of anything else? Uh, so Bloodstream infection is one of the issues. Right. So infection in the body, in the blood, would be a, a contraindication. Um, and if they're missing some of the formed elements of the blood, if they already have low levels of platelets, then mm -hmm. it becomes really hard to... Because of the blood thinning medication, because they will bleed even more if they don't have all the clotting factors uh, in the bloodstream. Um, those are the main ones. We we have a tendency to... to our criteria are very, um, I would say, we have a very uh, high threshold for turning someone down. We will do our best to try to get people on. And if we're not able to achieve the goals we have in mind, then we would much rather 
withdraw support rather than not give, an, uh, give them an opportunity to prove if they're able to pull through or not, so. Do you, sorry, can I ask a Yeah, Do absolutely. You have kind of a different approach to mm -hmm. anticoagulation therapy with CF patients because of their vitamin K or their common like liver disease issues? Very good question, another one. Um, not necessarily. Uh, we have multidisciplinary rounds. Our nutritionists are always in rounds with us, so we monitor those um, uh, factors very carefully. But in terms of target levels of uh, how much blood thinning to achieve, it's no different. Since this is a CF-based organization, mm -hmm. how long have you been using this process procedure with CF lung transplant patients? From at least anecdotally, from my much more localized area, it seems to be pretty new. Even though ECMO has been around for a long time, with CF patients, at least in the immediate area, I'm not south mm -hmm. of San Francisco, it's pretty new. Is why I know. We've been at UCSF. We've been using it for about 12, 13 years including CF patients, yeah. Okay, all right, so um, I'm gonna move on to the next topic, which is the breathing lung transplant um, uh, technology, or um, as someone said, lung in the box. Um, so despite our excellent outcomes, five to 10% of our patients, and I'm talking about UCSF patients, do not get an organ on time. And this number is as high as 20% in the country. Now, as shown in this graph, the, on the x-axis, uh, you have years of, uh, year of transplant, when somebody was transplanted, which year. And here on the y-axis is the number of uh, lung transplants. And, and this red curve uh, line shows number that are added to the waiting list. So, so when you look at this graph, you look to see that each year more and more patients are getting transplanted. But even more patients are added to the list, okay? So, so there's still this gap that we are adding more patients but not keeping up with the, uh, the number of transplants. So this gap exists because of donor organ shortage, suitable donor organ shortage. So, while I hope the future would look like this, that we will uh, start growing organs uh, in our laboratory on a bench and put them on the shelf and, you know, take them off the shelf whenever we need them, the reality is that more than 80% of donor lungs are turned down either due to poor function or due to geographic distances. And the reason is because we cannot keep the organs alive on ice for such a long periods of time because that's how we uh, transport the organs and how we preserve the organs before they're transplanted. So the current standard is, as I said, we make the organs really cold, okay, in the donor and outside of the donor's body, and then we pack them in ice and we bring them back. Now, this is, in my mind, is truly the lung in the box, but people still use lung in the box for the uh, breathing lung technology. So we bring them back to our transplant center in this sort of package. Now, we hope when we bring the, patient, the organs back to our transplant center that they're gonna work like they did when they were in the donor's body, but we have no way to assess them. We just keep our fingers crossed that they're gonna work out. What we're hoping to achieve is uh, this breathing lung technology, and I believe this is going to be the future. So currently this technology is only available as an investigational device for clinical trials. The, the premise behind this technology is that, as, I, as you recall, I said majority of the donor lungs are turned down because of poor function or geographic distances. So what we're hoping to do is by keeping the organs alive, by oxygenating them, by hooking them up to a ventilator, and by perfusing the organs with warm blood, we can keep them alive. And this hopefully will uh, eliminate the problem of geographic distances because the organs are alive, 
we are able to to treat those possibly poor functioning organs in the donor that we didn't have time to treat properly, but we can now treat them properly in the device with much higher doses of antibiotics, which we cannot do in a live person. Um, we're able to do bronchoscopies. It allows us to do so many different interventions that we know exactly what kind of organ we're going to be putting in at the end of the, uh, the run and how they would be functioning. Uh, this picture didn't turn out good, but this is the gentleman, Professor Steen. He's the gentleman who pioneered this technique in Sweden. And this was the first article published not too long ago, only in 2007. Several investigators from around the globe went to his institution to learn this technology, including the group from uh, Toronto General Hospital which has by, by far the largest experience in this technology now. They conducted a um, single center, non-randomized um, uh, trial of this breathing lung technology, comparing the marginal lungs that uh, were turned down by majority of the centers. They put them on this device, and then they looked at the outcomes in those recipients and compared them to the outcomes in the recipients who had gotten standard of care lungs, which were the ice cold preserved lungs, which were functioning very well in the donor. And they published this in New England Journal of Medicine in 2012. What they found was that when they compared the, this group, which is the breathing lung group, to the uh, control group, uh, which was uh, on ice but good functioning lung, bad functioning lung in the donor but good functioning in the device, when they compared them side by side, they found that not only did these so-called marginal lungs and the breathing lung technology uh, worked as well, they actually worked better than the uh, standard of care normally accepted good lungs. Furthermore, there was no difference in survival between the two groups of patients. So, there are currently several prospective trials that are ongoing uh, in both uh, in the U.S. and outside of the U.S. Uh, looking at this breathing lung technology both for standard of care lungs, which means that lungs that would have been otherwise accepted on ice, they are now putting them on the device to see if they will do even better, or lungs that have been rejected because of poor function, function or geographic reasons and then putting them on the device. We at UCSF, I was uh, in, involved in these two trials. These are the only two trials that are international. So several, several um, uh, hospitals have participated in this trial from uh, across the globe. The INSPIRE trial has uh, already completed last year. The EXPAND trial, we're still enrolling patients on this. The major difference between these two trials is that INSPIRE looked at breathing lung against the standard of care lungs, but these were both good lungs. The EXPAND is hoping to look at the marginal lungs that were turned down to see if they would get better by, by treating them on this device. So quickly, uh, to, to quickly review the INSPIRE trial, uh, larger centers that contributed. EXPAND trial is still ongoing, as I mentioned. Oh, uh, I should mention to you that um, um, that in the INSPIRE trial, it has completed, as I mentioned. Uh, the uh, I cannot right now share with you the results of the trial because we're in the process of publishing it, but the results are really exciting. That's all I can say so far. Uh, we are going to be presenting this at the end of this month at our uh, International Society of Heart and Lung Transplant meeting in Washington, D.C. So please stay tuned. Um, for the EXPAND trial, as I mentioned, it's still ongoing so far. Um, the plan is to enroll 55 patients, but I believe the, uh, the company is hoping to uh, increase that number to 75. So far, we have enrolled uh, contributed four to this. 
um, this particular trial, and these are the different continents that are involved in the trial right now. And as I mentioned, the hope with this particular trial, which I find it even more exciting than the uh, INSPIRE trial, is that this is the one that's hoping to expand the donor pool. And remember the graph I showed you where 20% of the patients did not get to a transplant on time. The hope is to have that gap be eliminated, okay? The red line and the blue bar gap to be eliminated by increasing the donor pool, reducing the waiting time on the list, and thereby reducing the mortality on the waiting list. I'm gonna briefly go over how this um, breathing lung technology works, okay? Um, let's see. So we go to the donor hospital, or if it's in our hospital, we go to the operating room. We will uh, recover the organs from the donor in our standard way. So these organs have already obviously reco been recovered. And now we're getting ready to put them on this uh, uh, breathing lung device. So this is the device right here. This tubing is going to get connected to the, the uh, artery that supplies the blood to the lungs. And so this is the tubing that supplies blood to the lung. There's a pump underneath that pumps the blood into the lungs. It's warm blood. And underneath there is the ventilator um, uh, tubing that ventilates the organ. We keep them warm at room temperature or body temperature. We pack them up. Now we're able to use, I forgot to show you a console. Um, the console allows us to assess the lungs on a minute to minute and hour to hour basis. When we come back to the hospital, the transplant center, we do one final assessment of the lungs. We make sure we're happy with the function as if they were, would have been accepted normally, and then we transplant them, okay? I have high hopes for this device because I think it can help not only people like Jane and others, and they can go on to have their bright future and do all the things they wanna do, rock climbing, uh-oh, uh, maybe non-alcoholic beers uh, to enjoy that. I forgot to, I should have taken that out. Uh-oh, okay. I am very thankful and grateful to my patients and their families for giving me the opportunity to be part of their lives and to make an impact. They put a lot of faith in me, and I'm very fortunate to have found a job that is so rewarding um, and given me a chance to give their family and friends a second chance at life. So. Wow. We finished a little bit early. So any questions I can answer for anybody? Yes. So um, I didn't quite understand how much longer the lung uh, can be kept before it's transplanted when it's being reconditioned like that. So the longest we've kept is 17 hours. And you've done all the reconditioning in that time? Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Thank you. Right. What kind of blood do you use what, that you put into that living lung? Is it transplanted? Or, I mean, just from a regular donor, um, blood donor, or is it? It's from the blood bank. The blood bank. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How does a person with CF with worsening lung function decide where to get a transplant? Um, do you have a transplant at your CF center if they also do lung transplantation? Um, what was the last part of the oh, question? Oh, do you have to have a transplant at your CF center if they also do lung transplant transplantation? Uh, not necessarily, but majority of the centers will have a cystic fibrosis center associated with the transplant uh, center. Uh, in terms of where to go for a transplant, uh, the first part of the question, uh, it truly depends on where you are and uh, what 
kind of access you have to, to transplant centers. It also partially is dependent on your insurance carrier, who they will allow you to go see. Uh, so, Mary Ellen, any other thoughts on that? I think you've hit the, uh, the, the high points. Um, I know that within the transplant community, the, um, the patients talk um, quite a bit about their experience, and, um, and I have had our own patients review the transplant outcomes and make decisions. But I would say that many of the CF patients are restricted by their insurance and the agreements the insurer has made with transplant programs, and so they really have to work within those limitations. Using blood, by, blood bank blood for that process, does that complicate the tissue matching and rejection issues? Because now you've got two different mm -hmm. sources of rejection possibilities. Uh, no, we have not seen that. And number two, uh, I would say overwhelming majority of uh, um, cases, uh, whether we use this device or without the device, patients will end up requiring blood transfusion regardless okay. for, for transplant right. cases. Because remember, when we take the organs out, the organs are full of blood and I can't squeeze it out. <laughs> no, I, I do my best, yeah, yeah, but, sure, but yeah. I can't complete. So, so we, I would say overwhelming majority will end up with one or two transfusions. Now, what is interesting is that for the ECMO patients, we need way more transfusions for these patients. And that's because, remember, they were on the blood thinning medication, so they've had blood loss from that. And two, the device is not without its uh, risks. Uh, the device can cause consumptive co coagulopathy, which basically means that all that tubing in the circuit that I showed you, the clotting factors get stuck to those tubing and it depletes the body of that. So as a result of that, they can clot when we operate. So they end up with m way more transfusion. But transfusion is always a concern for us. Very good question. But, and we are very, very careful in terms of how much we use. And this, uh, to answer your question, if somebody gets put on the ECMO machine and they're needing transfusion every day, they will get sensitized. Yeah. And they may no longer stay a candidate for transplant as a result of that, mm. if they form so many antibodies. I have another online question. My FEV1 is hovering at about 30% of predicted, and my CF team is talking more about plant transplant. I'm terrified of this. What can you say to encourage me as I explore this option? I think um, uh, as uh, maybe this was before we started talking, uh, the cystic fibrosis patients end up waiting on the waiting list for a long time. Uh, in the old days, and by old I mean before 2005, uh, when there was no lung allocation scoring system in place, these patients tend to be the only ones on the list or the COPD patients because all the other disease categories, they didn't make it. So it was a first come, first serve sort of uh, deal. But after 2005, cystic fibrosis patients have now um, disadvantaged on the list, which means that because you can live with your condition for a longer period of time, whether it's good quality or not is besides the point from an allocation standpoint. So as a result of this disadvantage on the list, you end up waiting a long time. So early referral to at least get plugged into the system, I would highly recommend it. Whether you need to go for transplant, your transplant team and your uh, local pulmonologist can make that decision. But in my opinion, and Mary Ellen's, um, you know, I'll ask her to voice her opinion. I would say that if you are getting to a point where FEV1 is starting to drop, uh, that it's probably not a bad idea to get at least an evaluation done, get to know the people so they know you, you know them, and if, if and when the time comes that, you know, you're good to go. Mary Ellen, do you have any? I'm the person that often recommends to patients in our uh, CF clinic at UCSF that it's time for us to consider lung transplant. 
And one of the first things I recommend to them is to actually have a meeting with, a, with the lung transplant team. The team is organized in such a way that the comprehensive evaluation by the physician and dietitian and social worker gives you an idea of the challenges that you personally are going to have to address as part of the lung transplant experience. But there's also a lot of information about what life is like during the period of time you're recovering from your transplant procedure and how you'll live with the new organs after transplant. And so that information that you get is really important in terms of alleviating um, a great deal of the anxiety a person with CF faces because in all honesty you really are face trading one chronic illness for another right. although the tr post transplant life um, is um, different in the sense that there's fewer of these intrusive respiratory therapies um, and it certainly is wonderful to be freed up from the burden of oxygen and breathlessness. Um, the second thing that I think is valuable and often um, recommended through the transplant center is to tap into the CF community experience with lung transplant. Recommend, you know, remembering, of course, that everybody's experience is going to be unique and different. But um, it's oftentimes uh, very illuminating to partner with one or more patients who have cystic fibrosis that have been transplanted to hear the really difficult issues they faced and then at the end of the day, maybe a year or more out where they are in terms of enjoying um, a freedom from medications and a higher level of functionality. I read about the case at Stanford where a woman with CF received a lung heart transplant and someone else received her heart. Do you think this is going to happen more often? Uh, not, not likely. Uh, there, there are cir special circumstances um, that, that lead to that sort of uh, intervention, uh, but that's not going to be the standard. With the study with the European countries participating as well, in Canada, I think I noted. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, it seems like whenever those of us in the CF world look at survival rates and all those things in other countries, and there can be a, a great variance, higher survival rates in Canada, and then there are always the reasons. Well, they do this there, they have socialized medicine or not, or in terms of transplant, is it kind of a leveler it, when you're doing a study like this in terms of you know, the, the playing field being fairly equal um, for the, when you're gathering Not the data? Does entirely, that make sense? entirely. Um, because uh, I think from a socialized medicine perspective, I can't speak to that, but just from a, um, a population perspective, uh, I can tell you that uh, the donor population is very different. Uh, in European countries compared to the U.S. Uh, I won't be able to, to talk about Canadian, uh, and we have not uh, uh, unblinded the data enough to look at those profiles, but just having had other studies published, for instance, the donor age in European countries is higher compared to the donor age in the U.S., for instance. There are a um, lot of studies showing that. Uh, and international, uh, the ISHLT registry shows that, that uh, the, the largest bracket in European countries anywhere between, the, for donor age is like between 45 to 59, whereas for us it's 35 to 49. That's where most of the donor organs come from. So that exists uh, in terms of, um, there's a type of donation called um, donation after circulatory death. Uh, in, in European countries, some of them, not all, Germany is certainly not one of them, uh, but Belgium and um, Austria, for instance, uh, more than 40% of organs come from those type of donors. In U.S., it is not very popular. Um, there are only two or three centers right now that are uh, recovering organs from those donors, including us. 
and we've had very good outcomes. So, so in terms of that, um, the data to answer your question, the data is not unblinded enough to see that. Uh, but from a socialized medicine perspective, there is one thing I could possibly comment on that uh, at a certain age in Europe, a patient is no longer considered a good candidate for a transplant because the way they look at it from a socialized perspective is that this patient was not going to have much to live, you know, with or without transplant. So, so the cutoff is a little bit more strict. Whereas in the U.S., that's not the case. We have um, our oldest uh, recipient was 75 years old. Um, so, and that trend is slowly, slowly starting to grow across the globe as well, but at a slower rate in Europe. Yes. Um, thanks. You talked a little bit about um, improving those kind of marginal organs with high doses of antibiotics. Mm -hmm. Can you say a little bit more about that and what that means in a very short time window? 17 hours doesn't seem like. Remarkably well, because um, uh, we're able to, to assess the lungs continuously. We can do bronchoscopies. We can continue to clear out secretions. And if it looks like the trend is not in the wrong, right direction, we won't accept the organs. That's the beauty of it. Whereas if we have the ice, you know, so-called ice cold organs, we don't have that, e even if, let's say, in the beginning when we accepted the organs and they were deemed good lungs, sometimes we find out when we transplant them in the recipient that actually these lungs had pneumonia and now we have to, instead of ex vivo treat the lungs, we are in vivo treating the lungs in the recipient. And occasionally in circumstances like the one that, the case of Jane that I discussed, when somebody's that acutely and severely ill, we know that an organ has um, pneumonia and we will still accept them because it's that or nothing. And we will treat the, uh, the pneumonia in the recipient. And uh, fortunately, uh, overwhelming majority of the times we're successful. So, but we cannot always guarantee it. Because remember, even though we're good, but we're not 100% good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kugreja, for this incredible information. That was fascinating, the footage. I just thought it was incredible. And we can only hope that the progress that you've discussed will continue to advance and spread across the nation to more transplant centers. Thanks to everyone who joined us this evening here in the room and to those of you who are watching online. And a special thanks again to Vertex Pharmaceuticals, Genentech, and Kiesi USA for sponsoring tonight's event and to Gilead Sciences for their additional support. Remember, everyone, April is Organ Donation Awareness Month, and I hope that everyone has signed up to be a donor. And if you haven't, now's the time. How could you not be inspired by that? And again, just go online to organ donor, one word, organdonor.gov, and you can sign up in your state. Before I go, I just want to let you know CFRI has been extremely active. Yes, we have the Discovery Series. We also have many events. Um, we have a monthly support group for caregivers. We have a CF summer retreat for adults with CF. We have uh, counseling. We are underwriting counseling sessions, individual therapy uh, for anybody impacted by CF. Uh, we have our big conference coming up this summer with a phenomenal lineup of speakers. So please go to our website to get more information or give us a call. And from all of us at CFRI, we look forward to seeing you at our next CF Discovery Series, which will be on Tuesday, May 10th. And it will feature CFRI's own Executive Director, Sue Landgraf, and Sherry Sager, who is the Chief Governmental uh, Relations Officer at Lucille Packard Children's Hospital at Stanford. And together, they are going to be talking about the vital need for and the impact of CF advocacy. So thank you all, and good night. Thank you.